outside. Far outside, Tis a man. Commander Carson had a cure from the back of the pack. Western Prize is flying. Tis a man getting rolling late. Tis a man had a cure, had a cure, and Tis a man noses apart. The opening of Dade Park tomorrow will be indicative of the biggest single proposition ever brought to Evansville. Evansville owes a vote of thanks to the promoters of Dade Park. They have accomplished much towards putting Evansville on the map in sections of the country that knew little or nothing of this city heretofore. The coming of Dade Park is significant of the coming of a bigger Evansville. It marks the entrance of Evansville into that select group of cities recognized as being metropolitan. That was the day, October 19th, 1922, that marked the beginning of a new age in tri-state recreation. Along with it came thoroughbreds, salted peanuts, gambling, and the ultimate experience for the entire family that would never be forgotten. The idea of this new racetrack was born from the members of the Green River Jockey Club and named after A.B. Barrett Dade, a famous race starter and a director of the local club. Construction was a collaborative effort from many companies and went relatively smoothly except for a minor defect in the original blueprints of the racetrack drawn by Ernest Bone. The track was designed three-eighths of a mile shorter than the original plans of one and a half miles. This issue was brought to light, but due to a strict starting date for the construction, the issue was pushed aside and construction began as planned. Construction finished and the park was opened on October 19th to meet the Grand Circuit performers. And the first race was held a month later on November 18th, 1922. Opening day brought in $62,000 and seemed to foreshadow years of upcoming success. Opening day spectators saw a towering grandstand capable of holding 6,500 fans, a nearly completed concrete paddock, and over a half a mile of newly constructed stables. But despite the park's overwhelming popularity, the Green River Jockey Club was unable to offset the construction costs and quickly went bankrupt. Dade Park was then auctioned off in 1924 and was sold to the future iconic figure James C. Ellis for a mere $35,100 less than 6% of the money initially invested by the Green River Jockey Club. From the beginning of Ellis' reign in 1924, thousands of citizens and troops from nearby bases flocked to the park to witness the intense races and as the depression swept through the tri-state in the early 30s to escape their troubling lives. Although it remained very popular, the park operated at a loss through the 20s and 30s but was kept alive by its devoted new owner, James C. Ellis, who vowed that Dade Park would continue to have racing annually so long as he lived. The mid-40s, however, brought a beneficial change to Dade Park. The park soon began to produce profits well above its previous expectations. Its owner, James C. Ellis, had not only kept the park alive, but transformed it into an overwhelmingly successful business. His many years of leadership and love for horse racing was honored in 1954 when Dade Park was renamed in his honor. The following season of 1955 ushered in the new name, and from that moment on, the park seemed to be reborn. Men, women, and children flocked from across the area simply to witness the hyped experience of race day. Ellis Park provided a form of entertainment second to none. Although James Ellis died in 1956, the new owner, Lester E. Yeager, Ellis's nephew, brought many improvements to the park. In 1955, a new paddock grandstand from Miller Field was relocated to Ellis Park and placed next to the original grandstands for additional seating. And about that same time, they built the Terrace Grandstand, which is no longer there now. The tornado wiped it out. But it was an old uh, a grandstand. It was at a ball diamond, a baseball diamond in Owensboro. And they tore it, disassembled it over there, brought it over here, and rebuilt it here. And it seated about a thousand people. And it was pretty popular for the horsemen because it sat right next to the paddock. And they could sit there in the grandstand and they could see the horses coming in and out of the paddock real well. And they had a real good view. Two years later, in 1957, a film patrol was built at the finish line. The new system captured the photo finishes that would determine the winners by mere inches. Throughout the following decades, Ellis Park continued to prosper and expand despite a few tragic occurrences. The infamous 37 flood swept the tri-state and covered the park when the neighboring Ohio River reached over 53 feet, 18 feet above the flood stage. You know, I've heard stories about it. When I was remodeling the office area, I found 
old papers and condition books and stuff from 1936 and 37 that had got washed up into the eaves or into the attic. In 1954 and 1962, the park's levee broke due to the river reaching over 44 feet. But uh, I can remember in like 53 or 54 when the levee broke and the track got filled full of water. And then after the, the river went down and they got pumping the water out, that the whole infield of the, the racetrack was full of water and full of fish. The 1962 flooding occurred during the expansion of the clubhouse to hold over a thousand more patrons, but did not hinder its completion date. In 1978 and 1995, minor barn fires swept through the stables killing a total of 58 horses. The most recent tragedy to hit the park was in 2005 when a devastating tornado swept through the heart of Ellis Park. The biggest thing that I had been through was the tornado in 2005. I came out here, when I got here it was like 2.30 in the morning, you really couldn't see anything because it was dark, but as it started getting daylight and you just look around and the devastation that, that there was, it was just everywhere you looked. We had, a, I think it was 173 or 172 horses stabled on the backside when it hit. And that was the main concern was the welfare and safety of all the horses. So that's the first thing we did was start going through the barns and locating horses and trying to get the horses rounded up, get them to safety. And we wound up, uh, lost three horses out of the horses that were stabled here. There was one killed outright and two of them that sustained injuries bad enough that uh, the owners deemed uh, you know, it best to go ahead and euthanize them. So, which I thought was, if you would have seen the devastation in the barns, we lost uh, 10 barns completely destroyed and another 10 that were heavily damaged. And uh, for, the, for the amount of damage that we had to have no more injuries than what it was, and we didn't have a person to get injured, we had some people living in the dormitories back there that were destroyed, and one guy was blue. He was living in the second floor, and it blew him clear out onto the ground, and he got up, walked away. Although the tornado caused extensive structural damage, it was optimistically seen as an opportunity for facility improvements. Since that unprecedented day, the park has been running normally and will surely continue its success for many years to come.